Welcome to God's House Tuscaloosa's Weekly Worship Videos for September 5th of 2021. I want to thank Jackie for her video with our prayers, music, and reading of the scriptures for today. Now let's prepare our hearts for reflection on these words. Let us pray. Holy God, loving Christ, living Spirit, as we hear your word about a good name, guide our hearts and minds to think on your ideals of excellence. We ask for wisdom to discern your truth, courage to pursue its ways, and faith to trust in its power. Even as the wisdom of this world differs from that truth, and many would lose heart in pursuing it, and even as the values of this world conflict with it, and many may choose a lesser goal in life, we ask that you would keep us faithful. And so now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our creator, savior, and source of life. Amen. The old saying goes, you can tell a person's priorities by how they spend their money. It may also be said that you can tell what kind of God a person believes in by how they act. And today's texts deal with this reality. The sermon is titled, A Good Name. A longer title would add, and an excellent name. And it's important to note the distinction. This lies in the steps to mediocrity or faithlessness when we drop Jesus Christ from our living priorities. When we substitute all sorts of other ideals and values, our message is, is harmed. <clears throat> we look for long, our measures of a person become defined by their wealth, their social status, their power to control, their physical prowess, or their intellectual ability. No longer is integrity of faith in God or consistency with the gospel of Jesus Christ a factor in calling someone good. How does this happen so easily? In the area of what is considered wisdom, we are easily discouraged by the evidence and presence of evil in this world. <clears throat> the psalmist speaks of a world that is morally good. Sometimes we write our own hymns of praise with apparent abandonment of the facts of life. Bad things do happen to good people. Eastern religions remind us of what they call the law of karma. Our actions have consequences proportionate to what we do for good or ill. Our own scriptures tell us that we reap what we sow. They also say that God sends the rain on the fields of the good and the evil alike. Global warming and local disasters affect all of us. The dilemma of this logic is the conundrum of God's justice, and it has found no clear answer in our human thinking, other than the simple one of faith to trust in God's goodwill and good purposes for us in life. So some people give up on God's wisdom and morality. It just doesn't make sense to their human experiences. The Proverbs text wisdom offers a consolation option. God has a special concern for the poor and the exploited, those who are abused. God's judgment certainly will come one day by and by. And yet the rich continue to rob the vulnerable. The top 1% shoot for the moon while farmers go bankrupt, workers do not make a living wage. The hungry, homeless and sick find no comfort or help. Discriminations and oppression abound. Education is underfunded and prison overflows and endless wars continue. So while some ignore God's desire for compassion, most of us are felt, feeling less than satisfied by the thoughts of something in the sweet by and by. Others would take up the moral mantra of God's special concern for the poor. But this too easily becomes a substitute attitude of privilege, a new form of election logic that simply replaces one favored group with another. Whatever group or individual head power has, that often gets omitted in the process is the responsibility that accompanies such power and resources. So we simply find it hard to break out of our logics of comparisons and competitions for privilege and ease. James points out that this also happens in our churches. Favoritism, 
bias and distinction between members occur in our daily interactions. Who do we notice walking in the door? How do we treat one another within our gatherings? Paul elsewhere lambasts the church potlucks for failing to share equity with, with everyone. Why is it that Sunday morning and congregational and denominational composition is segregated by race and class, and sometimes expressions of gender exclusion as well? Where there is not an outright exclusion, there is indifference toward the needy. One commentator on the parable of the Good Samaritan sees it as an illustration of three types of people. Those who are violent and exploitive, those who just don't care about anybody else, and those who do show compassion. Each character type reflects a belief about God. Again, we have to admit our difficulties and frustration with breaking from the prevailing world standards, because truthfully, Christians are often like the priest or Levite, just passing by and choosing not to get involved. And some claim to be Christian while doing violence even. Jesus has to deal with this challenge in his own life of how to live the truths about God. Scripture has a thread of common acts, actions of God. Enoch walked with God and did not face death. Noah escaped the flood. Abraham and Sarah were chosen for a new start. And God would create a new people of faith to be called God's elect, God's children from them. In the Exodus, God gave them the law as a sign of their belonging and being in covenant relationship with God. David was called a man after God's own heart. Were these works righteousness or were they grace? God has a knack for favoring particular people. Is this grace or privilege? That depends on our interpretation of the stories. In this story, Jesus came to his own people and they had flat worn him out. So he's left their land to rest and get some time away from them. But there were others whom God also had created and others who recognized him for his reputation and who believed in him. And they were crying out to him from the road. These were outsiders to the chosen people. How we hear Mark's story makes a difference in our understanding of it. Is Jesus saying to the Gentile woman that he does not care about her? If so, where is the love of a universal God in him? Or does this story lift up the faith of the marginalized, emboldening them to claim a place in God's house? Are they about Jesus' compassion for him, them too? Does Jesus expect Gentiles to become Jews first? Not in today's stories. Repeatedly, it is the outsider whose faith in Jesus is commended as greater than that of many insiders. So also we must ponder the challenges to our logic and faith. We must honestly faith, face how we live out our own beliefs and trust in God. Yes, it is tempting to avoid the dilemmas that trouble our senses of justice, love, and privilege as we think about God. And it's tempting to walk by on the other side of the road when it's inconvenient to express compassion. It's tempting to substitute other values as our priorities. But when this, we do this, do we still have a nagging sense of belief in God's goodness and fairness? Do we recognize the abiding faith in the poor and in ourselves? It is harder for the rich to trust God because there are so many other things to put their trust in. But is there an inner awareness of God's grace and love somehow at work in us amid all these dilemmas? Perhaps we have missed something in our considerations. As I read the biblical stories, I hear them consistently saying that God is at work in this world, reaching out with compassion and grace today. It is in God's own time and God's own way. It's not according to our own expectations. It's God's wisdom, which is not like our own. And consistently everywhere Jesus goes, his reputation precedes him. 
And this is why I've pursued all the above excuses we have made for not taking seriously the excellent name that is invoked over us in our profession of faith in Jesus Christ. If we carry the name of Christian with partiality, with attitudes of privilege, and without compassion or with indifference to the needs of others, if we carry it while pursuing our own gains and power, our own pleasures or any other personal goal, then we dishonor the one that we claim as our Lord. And we are inconsistent with the love of God, which was in Jesus Christ, whose spirit dwells in us since our baptism. We may still have a reasonably good reputation by this world's standards, but it's not the reputation of Jesus's love and compassion. Wherever Jesus went, people of faith looked for his coming and his reputation spread like wildfire fire. This was becoming a problem for his ministry. So much so that Jesus had to tell the people to stop broadcasting what he'd done. You know, it's really hard to ignore someone who has done all things well, be you a friend or a foe. As for us, we are not Jesus, but we are his people, and the church is his body. And the Spirit is at work in us today, transforming us into his image as the water of our baptism does its work in us. Our good name matters because it's supposed to reflect the image of Jesus in the world today. And this is what James is getting at. We need to look at the image of God that we represent in Jesus' name. When our lives and community relationships reflect the compassionate image of Jesus, then others will broadcast our reputation and there will be opportunities to show Christ at work in us all the time and everywhere, no matter how tired we are or how much we try to find a space to get away for a retreat. His name is the excellent name that's invoked over us in our baptism, the excellent reputation we are called to live, the witness to God, the spirit within us. It's a proclamation of God's love for us and for all of us equally as human beings in the loving presence of a faithful God. The excellent name is the one that matters, the witness that we have to this gospel of grace and love of God. Amen.